Good afternoon to everybody, to all the participants of this uh, workshop, which is uh, related to the study of neurodegenerative condition using positron emission tomography. I should tell you some technical notes. <clears throat> there will be <clears throat> my introduction and four and three speakers after me. And uh, uh, we all decided to keep uh, the questions at the end uh, of the presentations. You should use the um, question and answer writing system. And uh, so the discussion will be at the end. Share my presentation. So I'm Daniela Perani which I will introduce and chairing the session of the workshop. The speaker will be Rico Senkopele, and the title is Assessing of Alzheimer's Disease Pathology in the Living Human Brain. Gail Chetela will follow with a talk on evaluation, evaluating the brain reserve effect on neurodegeneration. And last recognize a unique tool for the in vivo assessment of brain metabolism, neurotransmission changes, protein load, and now novel PEC techniques are emerging for the study of molecular alterations of the brain. The availability of PET neuroimaging for the assessment of brain function, biology, and neuropathology has opened new venue in research, diagnostic design, and the conduction of clinical trials. And the workshop, this workshop critically will address the role of PET imaging. So neuroimaging in neuroscience and neurology concern the measurement of volume, brain structures, let's say. PET techniques, a difference, allows the measurement of functional parameters such as glucose metabolism, in vivo protein loads, so the real pathology, such as amyloid deposition and tau protein deposition. And other interesting aspects we'll not have enough time to discuss, I think, which is the role of neuroinflammation in the brain in pathology. This is a palette showing the importance of PET imaging in the neurodegenerative disease to assess what I just summary before. So amyloid burden, tau burden, and neurodegeneration. These are crucial parameters that has been used in research and now applied in clinical trials and in clinical um, settings. If you consider this important diagram, you see that measurement of amyloid or tau, either by PET or in the CSF, are important starting from the most earliest disease phases, the preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Here the topic is Alzheimer's disease for these uh, parameters. And really, PET can detect changes of amyloid and tau load and also on changes of metabolism before the full uh, clinical um, characteristics will develop. So before the cognitive impairment will be evident. And this is very, very important. Accordingly to this second diagram, PET measurement of amyloid and metabolism measurement, brain metabolism measurement with PET, look at here, are really, really early phenomena. Amyloid can increase along the disease up to a plateau. Alteration of the metabolism continue along the disease in a steady way up to the full dementia development, but can be present also before the emergence of clear-cut cognitive symptoms. And this is also very important. This is one of the most important aspects. We should say that considering all the research with PET on pathology, on in vivo pathology, 
protein deposition, such as amyloid, synuclein, tauopathy, they are shared by different neurogenetic diseases. Amyloidopathy, of course, are characterized by amyloid deposition in the majority of the subject, and so and so. But there is a sharing of pathology in the different diseases. So amyloid is present in different degenerative conditions, as well as tau, and the inflammation is possibly a characteristic of all the neurodegenerative diseases. So this is a, an important point to consider. So let's go to this measure, which I would like to highlight a little bit more, of consumption, energy consumption of the brain. Glucose is crucial for the neuron function. And it, it is a measure of synaptic activity. Okay, so it's a very, very important measurement, synaptic activity, synaptic density. FDG-PET has shown several patterns of hypometabolism in the neurodegenerative condition associated to dementia. So in the Alzheimer's disease spectrum, on the characteristic you see in red on these templates of hypometabolism of the brain, in the frontotemporal dementia spectrum, with other characteristics, hypometabolism pattern, as well as in the Parkinsonism. So this is a crucial aspect for diagnosis and differential diagnosis. The discriminative power of FTG, as you can see here in blue, is very, very high. And it goes close to the power that is emerging using tau -pet. We will hear about that uh, today in the world. But look, FTG is very, very important still in, as a discriminative tool. When it's very, very important, and this is my last message, in the pre-dementia phase. So in mild cognitive impairment, even in pre-MCI, when the cognitive impairment is very, very, very subtle, and even before, in subject that has no real cog detectable cognitive impairment, but just report a subjective complaint. This condition pertain to the preclinical phase. And in this preclinical phase, such as in my, my cognitive impairment, we can find behind different diseases, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal degeneration, dementia in the body, and so on and so on. So there are different pathologies in these preclinical phases. And we demonstrated with FTG PET patterns, characteristics of the different diseases in this early phase. And this pattern, and this is what is very, very crucial, predict the progression to that disease. So there is a, a precise risk of progression, a very specific and strong uh, evidence for risk of progression according to this measure. And you see other evidence in a huge uh, population with a sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy very, very high for this measurement of uh, brain function. When there is no alteration, this is again and still more important because no ne neurodegenerative diseases are in act. So FDG PET, it is useful for early diagnosis with characteristic pattern of ID or other dementia in preclinical outcome and in exclude the presence of neurodegeneration. In this study, we, we show, which is still a very important point, different metabolism pattern in two different uh, underlying diseases. But these cases were all comparable as a clinical point of view. They were amnestic MCI. So it's very difficult on a clinical basis to make a differential diagnosis. But this pattern involving only the temporomedial cortex is completely different from the pattern typical of AD. And in what is different, that this subject did not progress to dementia. Instead, all these subjects presenting this pattern, they progress to Alzheimer's dementia. This is very important. So another point related to this uh, new evidence is that tauopathy in the brain is heavily represented in subjects who, will pro who progressed or will progress and have the typical Alzheimer's disease pattern. 
Instead, there is nothing of very, very limited on the temporal media structure in the cell that did not progress. Last message is a recent paper we published in the subjective memory uh, complaint subject. It's a quite a large amount of subject. They have amyloid in the brain, but at a different uh, amount. The majority has uh, very little or nothing, intermediate or high level. And we found with PET normal brain function in the majority of the subject, 45%, or pattern of brain hypometabolism in the other half, predicting the future possible risk to progression to some kind of dementia. So uh, there is uh, some evidence that also this individual in the very, very, very early phase of disease can show some aspect of neurodegeneration or completely negativity of the scan. And this is very important. This paper published in Lancet, by it, it's an opinion paper, recommended, for example, that Alzheimer's disease diagnosis be restricted to people who have positive biomarkers together with specific clinical Alzheimer's disease phenotypes. If you don't have a clinical phenotype, it's better not to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. The follow-up of cognitive and impaired biomarker positive individuals suggests that the majority of these individuals do not progress over time. And this is a very important point. So amyloid PET, is an important measurement. Tau PET, we will see in the next uh, talks, are very important measurement, but the, a measure of neurodegeneration, especially in the very early phase, is also important. So I give you this message and I stop my presentation and introduction. Uh, thank you to all the collaborators and uh, shall we move to the first presentation? We will have um, we will have Rick Ossenkoppel presenting. You can go Rick with your presentation. So Professor Ossenkoppel is an associate professor in translational neuroscience, and is affiliated with both the Alzheimer Center of the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands and with the Lund University of Sweden. His research primarily focuses on improving the diagnosis and prognosis in persons with Alzheimer's disease, mainly through these techniques I introduced to you. So neuroimaging with PET. Thank you, Rick. Please start. All right. Many thanks, uh, Professor Barani, for the, the, the kind of introduction, also for your introductory talk. That was uh, a really nice setup for, for my talk. Um, and I also would like to thank the, the Prada Foundation for the opportunity to, uh, to, to present here today. So I will mainly talk about the assessment of Alzheimer's disease pathology uh, in the living human brain uh, and, and mainly focusing on, uh, on, on neuroimaging with, with PET. Here we go. So the content of today, so I will provide a little bit of, of background on uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and on PET, uh, because I know we, we have a really uh, diverse uh, public today. Then I'll shortly introduce amyloid and, and tau pet to you. Uh, and the majority of the talk will, will be really on, uh, uh, on the last parts where uh, I'll discuss what we have learned actually from uh, the, the past couple of years where we have been using amyloid and tau pet. Some applications of, of amyloid and tau pet also beyond just research only, but really in, into the clinic to help our, our patients. And also point out some of the future uh, directions of pet. And I think when you talk about the future, it's always really important to also look at the, uh, the historical uh, context. And we should realize that the, the problem of Alzheimer's disease um, is, is, is quite an old problem. So this first case um, of uh, an individual with Alzheimer's disease was described by Alois Alzheimer uh, in 1911. The, the, the patient was actually observed already in, in 1906. Uh, so more than a century ago now. Um, and Alois Alzheimer, apart from a, uh, a, a brilliant psychiatrist um, and, and um, uh, uh, neuropathologist, he was also a, a, an excellent painter. So th this was what he saw um, in the brain of Auguste Day, his, his patient um, that, that died a few years later 
because of Alzheimer's disease. And he found um, so-called plaques and, and tangles. You can see this beautifully drawn tangle right here. But it's good to realize that it, it took almost seven or eight decades before the scientific community found out that the plaques were actually containing uh, amyloid beta uh, proteins. And that the tangles actually consisted of tau pathology. So after that discovery, um, the so-called amyloid cascade hypothesis was proposed in, in 1992. I'm showing you here a more updated because the one in, in 1992 is, is, I would say, highly simplistic. This one is also highly simplistic because if it would be so easy, we would probably have already solved it. But this at least gives a little bit of, a, of an idea of how the disease may, uh, may emerge. So core of the amyloid cascade hypothesis is um, the, the APP, so the amyloid precursor protein. Um, in familial uh, cases of Alzheimer's disease, mutations in the APP or presenilin 1 or 2 genes, there's an overproduction of, uh, of APP. And in, in uh, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, there is a variety of factors that can contribute to, to this whole cascade. So this leads to uh, aggregation of A-beta-42, which in turn can uh, form uh, sol sol soluble forms of oligomeric A-beta or uh, amyloid plaques. And then in a very complicated interplay with uh, uh, microglia and astrocytes, vascular and neuronal components, um, eventually uh, paired helicofilaments of tau uh, are, are formed. That in turn is associated, associated with neuronal death, which can, for example, be measured using FTG-PET, which uh, Professor Parani showed uh, in her very nice introduction to the session. And that in turn may lead to, to cognitive impairment. So it's good to realize again that in the 80s, uh, amyloid beta and, and, uh, and, and, and tau uh, proteins were, were discovered. Um, and actually with neuroimaging techniques such as PET, we are actually able to, uh, to measure this in the living human brain. So amyloid PET, we can measure since roughly 2004. This is really the hallmark paper where the first cases uh, have been described. So in this case, you can here see the, the, the biochemical structure of the amyloid PET tracer. It's called Pittsburgh com Compound B. And um, uh, in an autoradiography study, uh, it was shown uh, that if you look at the white matter, there is essentially no difference of, uh, of, of tracer binding in a control versus an, an individual with Alzheimer's disease. However, if you look at the neocortex, you can see that there is high specific binding throughout the neocortex, which is absent in the, in a healthy control. So this shows that the amyloid beta plaques are actually being detected by this, this tracer. So also in the living human brain, uh, you, 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 you can see a similar thing. So this is a brain image of healthy control. The color bar indicates how many, uh, how much of the tracer binding is present. So the hotter colors in yellow and red indicate high tracer uptake. So this provides evidence that there may be a high amount of amyloid beta plaques in these areas of the brain. And you can easily see a big difference between this individual with Alzheimer's disease and a healthy control. So again, this first one was introduced in 2004. Um, this trace of Pittsburgh compound B was actually labeled with carbon 11. And you can see that its half lifetime is only 20 minutes, which means you need to have the production uh, really on site. Otherwise the, the radioactivity de decays and you will no longer have enough activity to, um, uh, to get enough signal. So therefore in the 2010s and a bit onwards, three other um, F18 labeled amyloid pet tracers were developed. They're listed here. They're all approved by both the European and the, um, uh, the American uh, institutions for the clinical use. So nowadays we, um, we have three amyloid pet tracers at our disposal uh, for clinical use. So for top pet, it took a little longer and um, the main idea is that it, it, it's very difficult to, um, to, to synthesize a PET tracer um, uh, that actually measures tau pathology. And the difference with amyloid pathology is that um, the, the target we're measuring is intracellular in, in, in the case of tau pathology. So the PET tracer needs to cross the blood brain bar barrier, which is challenge one. And then in addition, it needs to cross the cell mem membrane as well. Uh, so this took a little bit longer, uh, but in 2013, this was the first description of a um, uh, efficient tau pet tracer in, in the brain. Uh, you can see uh, when they were validating the tracer, this is brain tissue of an individual that was amyloid positive, but tau negative. You can see that there is essentially no um, uh, pet tracer binding, whereas in an individual that was both amyloid positive and also tau positive, you can see that there is actually binding uh, of the tracer, indicating that it's measuring tau pathology. 
What we also learned over the past couple of years um, is that PET captures relatively mature tau pathology. And what I mean by this is indicated here. So this is uh, a scan or a study where they performed um, a, a tau PET scans during life. And they compare this against the uh, amount of uh, tau neurofibrillary tangles at autopsy. So the higher this number, the higher the tau load. What you can appreciate, this is, by the way, the, the threshold. And you can see that the only tau PET positive cases during life are the ones in Bragg stage 4, 5, and 6. So in other words, tau PET really measures the more advanced stages of tau pathology. That is good to, uh, to uh, take into account for the rest of this uh, presentation. Also for tau PET, we're in the luxurious position to have at least four uh, excellent uh, tau PET tracers. I've, I've listed them here. And what you can clearly see is that those four tracers discriminate very well between people that have unimpaired cognition versus those with impaired cognition. So just by eyeballing, you see immense differences between the groups. And also the patterns across those tracers are quite similar. So we see uptake in the temporal parietal cortex, in the medial parietal cortex, so posterior cingulate and the precuneus, but also in the medial temporal lobe region. So really in the Alzheimer's disease specific regions. So what have we learned over the, the, the past years? And I have to highlight this is really a selection of results because there's, there's a lot of research uh, going on. So one of the things we were very interested about, uh, in, in was what is actually the prevalence of, of amyloid positivity um, in people with normal cognition here in blue, in gray people with uh, SCI, so subjective cognitive impairment. So they, they, uh, there are individuals that complain about their memory, but on objective testing, they don't show any impairments. And this is a group with mild cognitive impairment. So they have mild symptoms, mostly and mainly in the memory domain, but it's not severe enough to call it uh, dementia. So here you can see the proportion of people in those groups that are amyloid positive, and it's plotted as a function of age. And what we can see for all those groups, that the older people get, the higher the prevalence of amyloid beta pathology. So age is a major risk factor for amyloid uh, positivity on PET. And this is especially the case in individuals that are APOE4 carriers. So we're looking now again at the plot of people with normal cognition, same plot, but now we're looking at um, uh, people stratified by their APOE status. So they have either one or two APOE4 alleles. And we know from APOE4, it's, it's the, the major risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And what we can see, if you are around age 80, um, that roughly 80% of the people that carry at least one E4 allele are amyloid positive. And again, this is in people with normal cognition. So you, you wouldn't really notice it from, from the outside. Then the next question is, okay, so if you're cognitively normal and you're amyloid positive, what are the implications? And I think this study is actually a really nice summary of, of all the literature on, on this topic. So what this study did, they, um, did a, they performed a very sensitive cognitive test. And the lower the score gets, the worse the performance on this particular test. So these are the years after the baseline. And at this point, an amyloid PET scan was made, and the authors cre created two groups. One was a group with normal amyloid levels and a group with elevated amyloid levels. And what you can see that actually for the first couple of years, there's no difference between those slopes. So the, the groups on average perform equally, equally, equally well. It's just after, let's say, four years that the slopes start to diverge and that the people with amyloid, uh, elevated amyloid pathology start to decline, decline at a higher rate compared to people with normal amyloid. So they're at modest risk for especially longitudinal cognitive decline. So this picture is quite different, I would say, for, for tau load as measured with PET. So we're looking here at a, at a recent study that we did. Um, in these plots on the y-axis, you can see the slope in a global measure of cognition. So again, the lower this number, the, the faster the, the clinical progression. And this is the amount of tau pathology in the brain going from low to higher. And across the whole group, you can see a strong correlation. So the more tau pathology in the brain, the faster the, the cognitive decline. And already in a very early stage, in people that are, uh, are cognitively unimpaired, but are amyloid positive, you can see that this relationship is there. So people with higher tau load in those groups are also the ones that decline the fastest over time. And Professor uh, Perani already mentioned the, uh, one, one, one set of criteria. So there's, mo uh, there's a big debate going on in the field about the meaning of cognitively normal people um, in, as a function of their, their amyloid and, and tau status. And we thought that 
uh, there was actually not sufficient data to, to actually test this. So what we wanted to do, so we wanted to create four different groups. So we had a group of people that were amyloid negative and tau negative, a group that was amyloid positive and tau negative, and a group that was amyloid positive and tau positive, either only in the medial temporal lobe or in the medial temporal lobe plus in the neocortex, as you can see here. And what you can see is that those two sets of criteria have a completely different uh, way of naming those particular groups. And it begins already here, where um, an individual that's amyloid positive and tau negative would, by the international working group, would be considered at risk for progression to Alzheimer's disease. Whereas, according to the NIA, this would be considered preclinical AD pathological change. And when someone has amyloid positive uh, positivity and tau positivity, this individual would be considered having preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Whereas in the other criteria, it would be at risk for progression to AD. So in this study, we aim to address whether um, the term preclinical AD would be more justified. And I think we, we uh, can provide evidence by that by showing very high rates of cognitive decline over time, or whether they're just at risk for, uh, for progression. So here you can, the results of the, of the four different groups we have, we have mentioned. So for the, um, uh, on the y-axis, you can see the, the, uh, the survival uh, probability for progression to mild cognitive impairment. So all the people started out as cognitively unimpaired in the study. Uh, and what we can see here is that when we look at the completely biomarker negative group, the slope is relatively uh, uh, um, uh, flat over time. So there are not, not many individuals that progress to MCI in this group. It's slightly higher in people that are amyloid positive, but tau negative. It's significantly different from the completely ne negative group, but this effect is modest. You can see that the biggest changes really occur in people that are both amyloid and tau pet positive, where you can see that after approximately three and a half year, years, half of this group has progressed to, uh, to MCI. And the hazard ratios are also really high. They're up to 19 in the group that has amyloid um, and tau in the, in the, in the neocortex. When we look at progression to all-cause dementia, you can see that these numbers are even higher, especially in the group that uh, has uh, tau pathology in the neocortex with a hazard ratio of up to uh, 41. So they're really at high risk for relatively short-term future um, cognitive decline. Another thing uh, I think that's that's quite valuable from the, the, re the recent literature is the regional information that's provided by both amyloid and, uh, and tau PET. So here you're looking at a typical uh, positive amyloid PET scan. What we see here is that there is a tracer uptake essentially across the entire neocortex. There is sparing of the sensory motor cortex, which is, which is very uh, typical. And also the occipital pole and the temporal pole are, are relatively spared. But other than that, the, the entire neocortex is, is essentially uh, occupied by, uh, by amyloid pathology. And this is irrespective of the, the clinical syndrome of, uh, of the patient. And this led to a very interesting study led by, by the next speaker, Professor uh, uh, Gael Chetela. And they really assessed these, this regional um, mismatch between amyloid PET, which is indicated in blue, and two measures of neurodegeneration. So structure MRI used to measure atrophy and FTG PET to measure glucose hypometabolism. And there are two um, regions that are showing a high regional mismatch. The first one is actually the medial temporal, temporal lobe. So in this case, the hippocampus and the amygdala combined. And in this area, you can see that there's severe neurodegeneration going on. So there's a lot of atrophy, there's a lot of glucose hypometabolism, but the levels of amyloid are really low in, uh, in that particular part of the brain. And the opposite is actually true in the frontal cortex. So we know for amyloid pathology, one of the earliest regions to, to change uh, is the, uh, the prefrontal uh, cortex. So that has a very high amyloid load. You can see it here. But there's modest neuro neurodegeneration going on. So based on this, we were very interested to see whether maybe tau pathology could be the missing link between amyloid pathology and then neurodegeneration. Um, so this was the, actually the first individual with Alzheimer's disease um, that underwent a tau PET scan that, that, that I've seen in my, uh, in, uh, in my career. It was a special patient. It was an individual with posterior cortical atrophy. And this is also known as the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease. So the main symptoms are not memory, uh, but the main symptoms are uh, problems, for example, recognizing objects or uh, trouble um, uh, estimating distance or, or location. So all sorts of visually uh, related uh, impairments. So we did four imaging uh, modalities on this individual, including a MRI, 
an, and an FTG PET scan. And as Professor Parani already highlighted very nicely, the, the regional areas that show hypometabolism, they correspond very well to the regions that are um, also um, involved in, in the particular um, cognitive symptoms that are showing up. So in this case, we see a lot of glucose hypometabolism in the posterior parts of the brain, as indicated by all the red arrows. So as, so, uh, as expected, the amyloid beta PET scan showed a widespread sort of uh, aspecific pattern, I would say. So there's essentially amyloid beta pathology all over the brain in areas with and without hypometabolism. So then we were very curious to see what would happen with the, the tau PET scan. And what we actually found is that the tau PET scan was sort of a mirror image of the FTG PET scan. So if you would put the tau PET scan on top of the FTG PET scan, you would see that the areas with high tau pathology are the, reg the regions that show glucose hypometabolism throughout. So this was very impressive and also suggesting that indeed the, 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 uh, the, there's a very strong correlation between regions occupied by tau pathology and areas that show um, glucose hypometabolism. We confirmed this in a slightly larger sample uh, where we had 10 individuals with the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, again showing amyloid pathology throughout the brain, whereas for tau pathology, it was really restricted to the posterior areas of the brain. And just again, in the, to indicate the, 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 the functional uh, relevance of this, uh, if we look at the, at the visual system that we have studied very well in, in neuroscience, we can see that um, the basic visual processing is essentially happen happening in, 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 uh, in the primary um, visual cortex, in, in the occipital cortex. From there, there are two streams, the wear stream going up to the, the parietal cortex and down to the temporal uh, cortex, which is called the what stream. And if you look at those systems and we compare it against the pattern we see in the visual presentation of Alzheimer's disease, we can understand why this individual had these visual um, uh, impairments. Now move on to potential applications of amyloid tau PET. And I'm, I'm starting with, with research. And one of them is that we are working towards more bio biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. So this is based on the ATN system. A stands for amyloid, T for tau, N for neurodegeneration. And um, you can see here that individuals, again, that are amyloid positive and tau po positive um, can be considered uh, ha uh, having Alzheimer's disease according to this research uh, criteria. And of course, PET can play a really big role in determining the A uh, and the T using amyloid and tau PET, but potentially also for the N using FTG PET, for example. The next step actually in this system is to put the syndrome on top of the biology. So it's biology first and then the clinical syndrome. So in this case, uh, individuals that are amyloid positive and tau positive are considered to have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. At the MCI stage, it's called Alzheimer's disease with MCI or prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And in the dementia stage, it's Alzheimer's disease with dementia. But the uh, diagnosis in this case, or the labeling is Alzheimer's disease. Then amyloid beta has been around uh, uh, again since, since roughly 2010. This is a really big study uh, performed in, in Northern America that included more than 16,000 individuals with MCI or dementia in, 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 all, in, in a wide variety of, of clinics throughout uh, Northern America. Uh, and they actually did a, um, uh, a, a post-diagnosis uh, amyloid PET scan. So there was first the diagnostic process, then an amyloid PET scan, and then they evaluated the potential changes of amyloid PET on a change in management. And this is one example where they looked at Alzheimer's disease medications. And where you can see that um, the, the post-PET um, uh, Alzheimer drug use was much higher compared to the pre-PET um, uh, use, especially in individuals that were uh, amyloid PET positive. This was true for both dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So this, this suggests that um, uh, applying amyloid PET as a diagnostic tool uh, fine tunes the, the, the patient man management of individuals um, uh, suspected of, of Alzheimer's disease. So for tau PET, it's much earlier days. I think we're now at sort of the cross, um, uh, uh, the cross time uh, before entering the, 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 the clinic. Um, this was, I guess, a study that could help uh, making that step. So what we did in this study, we looked at tau PET across the Alzheimer's disease spectrum. You can see it here going up from healthy controls to people with MCI that were amyloid positive and AD dementia. And you can see across those groups, there is a gradual increase of tau pathology. 
And this is a group with people that had a non-AD disorder. So this is a, a combination of people with frontal temporal dementia and vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, etc. You can see that on average, they show clearly less top head uptake compared to the AD dementia group. And if you translate this into, into numbers, you can see that at the dementia stage, so AD dementia versus all these non-AD neurodegenerative disorders together, you get very high numbers, a sensitivity of about 90% and a specificity slightly above 90% as well. So this is really uh, excellent diagnostic accuracy. What you will also notice that this drops at the MCI stage. So those are uh, the voxelized areas on, under the curve. You can see that those, um, uh, there's much less of a difference between MCI due to AD versus non-AD compared to AD dementia versus non-AD. And especially the sensitivity here drops uh, quite dramatically to, uh, to just about 60%. And this is in line with what I showed you earlier, that tau pet is really a measure of advanced um, tau pathology um, and has a relatively low sensitivity at pre-dementia stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So more recently, uh, uh, fluoroxetine was was approved by the FDA for for clinical use, and specifically for this scenario where there was a differential diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease versus other neurodegenerative disorders in the dementia stage. So what we argued in a position paper is that, um, uh, of course, after uh, an initial screening, you may consider in specific settings to use a tau PET scan. Um, because I think it's uh, based on its high sensitivity and specificity, you can actually use it to rule in a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So if the, the tau PET scan is positive, indicating there's clear neocortical tau pathology, you can with quite high likelihood say that the, the underlying etiology is Alzheimer's disease. If the scan is negative, you can consider other um, options. For example, for frontal temporal dementia, you could consider an FTG PET scan, for DLB, a dot spec scan, and for vascular dementia, maybe some more advanced MRI measures to detect uh, white matter lesions. And also for clinical trials, neuroimaging is, uh, is a, a very helpful and, and, and in some cases promising tool. This is one example for the monitoring um, the effects of anti-amyloid beta drugs. So this is pre and post uh, treatment with, with uh, aducanumab, a, a monoclonal antibody against amyloid beta pathology. And you can see that the drug after 18 months almost entirely removed the amyloid plaque load in this individual. It can also be used for um, uh, the selection uh, of participants based on, on biomarkers. So the outcomes here was, uh, was tau PET signal over time. And we compare here tau PET against plasma P tau. And what we can conclude from, from this is that tau PET by itself was a stronger um, predictor than, than plasma P tau 217. Uh, but in combination, uh, they were even better. So there's also some, some benefit potentially in combining biofluid and neuroimaging markers in the future. And we have also uh, recently discussed the potential of imaging markers for improving target engagement. And in some scenarios, for example, if you want to, um, um, uh, to show target engagement, for example, with immunotherapies or aggregation inhibitors, I think PET is preferred over those biofluid markers, again, because it's measuring the, the soluble species of, uh, of tau. So in terms of the future directions, again, due to the uh, relatively restricted amount of time, I had to focus on, on Alzheimer's disease. So I had to ignore uh, other neurodegenerative dis dis diseases. And I really had to focus on pathology. And we know there's many other things going on in the brain uh, apart from, uh, from amyloid beta and tau PET. So I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on these two aspects in, in the future directions. And the first one so far in the hypothetical model of Alzheimer's disease, we had more or less a, a pretty ideal uh, situation, right? Where there was an individual that has elevated amyloid beta and tau that is well above the pathological threshold. And there are other um, uh, pathological processes in the brain that are well below the pathological threshold. And I compare this, you know, when you, for example, go to visit the Louvre, this is what you have in mind if you want to observe uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, again, hypothetically. But this is often what happens in, in the real world. Um, in this case, uh, what we see very often is, yes, there is indeed elevated A-beta and tau pathology, but in addition to that, there's another uh, proteinopathy that is abnormal. In this case, for example, TDB43. And what's also quite common is that there is actually a very complex interplay between many things going on at the same time. And to give you a little bit of an appreciation or whether this is uh, rare or occurs on a quite common scale, I think the latter is true. This is a, a, a very, um, um, I would say, impressive study in people 
that were relatively old, 87 on average, and they had dementia. And they measured the amount of pathologies that were present in the brain. You can see that roughly 20% of them had QMP, which stands for quadruple misfolded proteins. So 20% of those individuals had amyloid and tau and alpha-synuclein and TDP43, which really highlights the complexity of, of dementia, where there are so many things going on at, uh, at the same time. And also, uh, of course, amyloid beta and tau we can measure very well um, with PET. Alpha-synuclein and TDP, that, that is less the case. Although a recent development in the alpha-synuclein PET uh, data shows some, some promising uh, preliminary results, um, this is a, 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 a new tracer, uh, an alpha-synuclein PET tracer uh, that was tested in Parkinsonian disorders versus controls. And here you can see that uh, compared to age-matched controls in an individual with multiple system atrophy, it's a, it's a Parkinsonian disorder also caused by alpha-synuclein, you can see that there is increased signal relative to the control, and the same is true, although to a more modest degree in, in an individual with Parkinson's disease here. But unfortunately, this is not true for, for all the neurogenerative diseases we, uh, we, we would like to study and eventually cure. So, for example, if you look at the clinical syndrome, and they are color-coded by the underlying etiology. And you can see that in many cases, there is a wide variety causing these clinical syndromes. Um, and for many of those primary etiologies, including the primary tauopathy, so 3R and 4R tau pathologies, um, but also the FTLD, FTLD TDPs, there are no um, uh, highly efficient PET tracers available at the moment. And also so far, we've mainly focused on, on proteinopathies. Uh, I guess that's one way of approaching the, the disease. Uh, another option for potential cure could be to looking at things that either um, are upstream of the pathologies or modify its effects on the brain. Uh, a very popular one is neuroinflammation, which makes a lot of sense given all the genetic evidence um, of high uh, impact of, of microglia and astrocytes in, into the, the uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, pathogenesis. Uh, so this will be an, on, an ongoing target. There are many approaches to, 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 to actually measuring microglia and astrocytes in, um, uh, in the brain and their, their function and their density. Um, more recently, um, there was also a tracer introduced that uh, gives us an impression of synaptic density, which is potentially the closest thing we have to, uh, uh, to, to, to cognition, because it, it's such a strong correlate of, of cognition. And also there are some more novel targets, for example, epigenetic dysregulation through the ADHC1 um, uh, protein. So to summarize uh, this talk, um, I've shown that H and APOE genotype are strongly associated with amyloid positivity. Amyloid positive cognitive, cognitively unimpaired individuals are at increased risk for longitudinal cognitive decline. But individuals that are both amyloid positive and tau, tau pet positive show a very rapid short-term clinical progression. So they are really at high risk. We also saw that regional tau pathology, but not amyloid, mirrors the patterns of neurodegeneration. Amyloid PET is now widely used in the clinic and trials, and is also shown to improve actually the, the diagnostic process. Tau PET is, is, a, uh, uh, is a bit earlier in that development, but has great potential, both as a diagnostic, but potentially also as a prognostic marker, because it, it's so strongly predictive of future cognitive decline. And in the end, we really need novel PET traces for the primary tauopathies for alpha-synuclein and for TDP43. And with that, I would like to thank all my colleagues and, and teams and, and the funding agents. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to this discussion after the, the next two talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick, Professor Senkopele. And uh, we have to go on with the next uh, talk by Gail Chetela. She is a research director at INSERM, IKN, the INSERM unit. Team Neuropresage, University of Cairn, Normandy. She's an outstanding neuroscientist and the results of her researches are reported in publication in leading scientific journals. Gail, please start with your presentation. Thank you very much. The title, you of course can read it <laughs> at the beginning. Thank you very much, Professor Perani. Thanks for the introduction, for the invitation, and also would like to thank Prada uh, Foundation for uh, organizing this symposium. 
So I've been invited to discuss about how we evaluate the brain reserve effect on your degeneration. Um, so um, as you know, and has, as has been introduced, uh, amyloid deposition, A-beta pathology and tau pathology are the two main uh, pathological processes uh, that makes the definition of Alzheimer's disease now. And uh, there are also other pathological processes that may interact. Uh, the manifestation is amyloid deposition and neurofibrillary tangles for A beta and tau respectively, but also through interactions and complex processes they are conducting to synaptic and neural loss, but also other manifest manifestation that are thought to be at least uh, partly independent from uh, AD uh, pathological processes. We have biomarkers that are more or less specific of those manifestation. So uh, there is a lot to do to understand what is uh, what are the pathological processes there. But what we can say is that about 40% of AD cases are due to modifiable risk factors as we more and more acknowledge the, the role of genetic but also environmental risk factors. There is hope that uh, intervention using those modifiable risk factors might help reduce the risk and load of the disease. So uh, a lot of works have been done over the last 10 years mainly to identify the most important uh, risk factors. And we know now that, um, that uh, keeping active, checking the hearing, uh, staying socially connected, enjoying our social activities, eating healthy and being careful about our heart health, um, help to reduce the risk of dementia. So, um, so we know that about one out of three cases of dementia could be prevented by uh, action on those risk factors. And uh, those factors vary across the lifespan. So uh, that the most important factors in early life are different from those in midlife from, and from those in late life. Um, so this is the, uh, just a, a short representation of cognitive and brain reserve uh, theory. So uh, from Stern and collaborator, so the cognitive, uh, cognitive reserve theory um, postulates that people with high reserve would tolerate a higher level of neuropathology before they show cognitive decline compared to those with low reserve. You can also see that once they decline, they decline faster. So that at a certain point it might be the reverse, but still you can see that a higher level of neuropathology is needed in those with high reserve to, uh, to show cognitive decline and, and convert to MCI or uh, AD. Uh, so cognitive reserve is representing this um, uh, the fact that you might tolerate more brain alteration before you show cognitive decline. Um, and brain uh, reserve is uh, illustrating the direct effect that uh, some protective lifestyle factors, for example, might have on your brain so that it will be, um, it will show like, for example, higher uh, volume, higher regional volume uh, than those with lower brain reserve. And this is illustrating the fact that brain and cognitive reserve are thought to have additive effects so that you can see here that patient four that show high brain and high co higher cognitive reserve compared to patient two uh, uh, would tolerate, uh, would show higher functional status at the same level uh, of, of uh, brain alteration. Um, so this figure illustrates the proposition that different disciplines here would contribute to advance uh, our knowledge in the field and the strength and uh, limitation of each compensating the uh, limitation of the others. So you have here, for example, cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology that provide models for cognition and to examine the association between brain and behavior. Network neuroscience allows to describe and explain non-local complexity in neural systems. And the control theory gives us the means that uh, to identify 
control roles and strategies in neural, in neural data. So I would uh, discuss briefly about the reserve concept as assessed by those three disciplines, but, uh, and uh, for the last one, I will mainly talk about intervention. So um, as for the first one, so the studies that assess uh, uh, the, the clinical neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience, I would first discuss studies assessing the links between brain and lifestyle to further understand the mechanisms of reserve. So in those studies, uh, as I said, they, would, they are assessing the relationships between different neuroimaging markers and different uh, lifestyle um, factors that are thought to be associated with uh, reserve. Um, and uh, I'm just giving here two examples. You can see here on the left side, a positive correlation between the, uh, uh, the, the, the education throughout life and hippocampal volume. So uh, let's say cognitive activity throughout life and uh, the volume of the hippocampus. And you can see here, uh, that um, past cognitive activity score, so still cognitive activity is associated, higher cognitivity activity is associated with, um, with lower uh, PIP uptake. So uh, on the other hand, and this is assessed in cognitively unimpaired older adults. On the other hand, you can see that the results are contrasted and in, in the inverse direct direction in those two other studies that are conducted in AD dementia patients so that Higher education is associated with lower cortical thickness and with higher amyloid deposition. So there is kind of a paradox uh, between uh, these studies that shows uh, inverse results. And uh, so we, we have uh, uh, assessed whether uh, there were, there were sick, whether the relationship differed across clinical group by assessing the interaction between years of education and group on amyloid deposition. And assessing this uh, relationship, we found significant interactions such that the relationship between amyloid deposition and years of education was significantly different across groups. So splitting by groups, we showed that in cognitively unimpaired older adults, there, were, there was a negative association between years of education and flow beta and amyloid uh, load. In contrast, in patients with my cognitive impairment, there was a positive association such that those with higher years of education showed greater amyloid deposition. And we thought that this might reveal distinct brain mechanisms. Uh, reserve is supposed to be uh, studied by distinct, uh, res distinct me mechanisms, uh, neuroproduction, uh, illustrating direct effects of lifestyle factors on brain health and AD pathology. And in this case, you would expect to show um, that a positive lifestyle would be positively associated with markers of brain health. So that lifestyle, those positive lifestyle factors would help preserving, maintaining brain health. On the other hand, there are also compensation mechanisms such that, and, and this would be represented by here, the uh, impact of lifestyle factors on the association between brain health and cognition, such that positive lifestyle factors would help coping with the pathology, and this would result in an inverse relationship between positive lifestyle and brain health, such that the positive lifestyle would be associated with a lower brain health at the same level of cognitive performance. And what we uh, showed is that the, um, the, 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 the neuroprotection is uh, more prominent in participants with uh, normal cognition, while uh, the composition processes are more uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, acting in later stages. Uh, as the disease progress in MCI and uh, early AD stages. There are several possible mechanisms underlying compensation that has been postulated that, like I, I will just give, give a few examples here. Uh, in the same study I was describing before, uh, so you can see uh, the, the negative association between amyloid and years of education in healthier older adults and the, and the positive association in my cognitive impairment. 
And uh, we were wondering whether these positive associations, such that those with higher education could tolerate more amyloid deposition, was underlined by um, glucose consumption. And we found that in the same brain areas, there was a positive association uh, with years of education and uh, FDG PET, such that those with higher amyloid, uh, uh, higher years of education that are able to tolerate higher amyloid deposition, probably because they are able to show higher level of uh, glucose uh, metabolism. Another hypothesis is the, the upregulation of the cholinergic and nor noradrenergic pathways. So in this study, glucose metabolism and volume of the basal for brain, which is the major cholinergic structure, and the hippocampus, which is a relevant um, projection site for the basal for brain, was measured across different uh, groups of participants, including controls, MCI, and AD patients, and across uh, different level of uh, education. And what they show is decreased volume and metabolism of the basal for brain, but they also show that in high, uh, sorry, decreased level of, uh, uh, in the basal for brain in patients with MCI and still more in AD patients compared to controls, but in high educated groups, they show that patients with MCI showed higher level of um, uh, volume and metabolism in the basal for brain. So that MCI with a higher education uh, show upregulation of cholinergic activity, and this appears to have a compensatory effect, uh, which is lost in later stages. So, um, also as for the noradrenaline theory of cognitive reserve, it postulates that the upregulation of the locus coelus noradrenergic system, which originates in the brainstem might facilitate uh, uh, cortical networks involved in attention and protected activation of the system, which would operate throughout the lifespan and enhance cognitive stimulation, which would contribute to cognitive reserve. To test this hypothesis in this study, the authors assess the relationship between the locus coelus volume, attentional performance, and a biological marker of brain maintenance. And what they showed is that the volume of the locus coelus correlated with attentional performance and with the uh, index of brain maintenance. And um, they also showed that the volume of the locus coelus was the main significant mediator of the relationship between brain maintenance and cognitive performance in uh, the MCI group. So they uh, conclude that these results support the role of the noradrenergic system as a key mediator underpinning the neuropsychology of reserve. Um, so another uh, theory is that brain connectivity and networks might contribute to reserve. And I will discuss this in the next section uh, on uh, network neuroscience. Uh, but before I would just highlight another study, another, uh, I think, important point when discussing about reserve that has emerged in, uh, from the clinical neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience studies assessing this uh, topic, which is sex differences. First studies have shown that um, women seem to bear a bigger burden. Uh, uh, and uh, this is shown from anti and postmortem evidence for reserve in the face of tau. So you can see here the relationship in uh, men and women between tau load and memory performance. And if we if we take the uh, residuals from this relationship, we can that that is a reflect of reserve. We can see that uh, this is. Uh, these residuals are higher in women than men, which illustrates the fact that, um, that women demonstrate higher reserve to tau than men. And also uh, uh, among participants with similar level uh, of um, AD pathology, women show uh, higher verbal memory performances compared to men. 
uh, in uh, this study also by uh, Rika Sokopol, um, the, the, the authors assessed which demographic, genetic, and neuroimaging factors were associated with cognitive and brain resilience to pathological tau in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And they found out that if they used an, in, an index of brain reserve, younger age, but also female sex was associated with higher brain reserve compared to, and greater uh, brain resilience compared to male and um, older people. In, uh, in uh, this study by Matt Petit collaborator, uh, the authors shown that uh, there was a positive correlation between education and glucose metabolism in healthy elderly in different regions in males and in females. And this was also true for the negative correlations between education and glucose metabolism in AD patients such that uh, different regions might be impacted in men and women and different mechanisms might uh, operate. In, in this study from the lab, from Julie Gonot and collaborators, uh, we have also assessed uh, the impact on the brain of physical activity throughout life in women and men. We found the same level of physical activity in uh, both groups, but what we've shown is that in men, the level of physical activity was negatively associated in blue here with amyloid load, higher level of activity, lower amyloid load, while in women, the level of um, physical activity was associated with brain perfusion and not with amyloid, such that higher level of physical activity was associated with higher brain perfusion. So it shows a differential effect of physical activity of the brain in men and women, suggestive again, of distinct protection and reserve uh, mechanisms. Um, in this last study, we also assess the impact of anxiety symptoms throughout life. And we've shown that anxiety increase uh, with age only in women and is associated with decrease, this increase in anxiety uh, in women is associated with decreased brain activity, uh, brain integrity, so decreased brain volume, but also glucose metabolism only in women, suggesting that there is a deleterious effect of anxiety on the brain in women only. So uh, just a few words about um, assessing reserve through network neuroscience. Um, so I would like first to mention here the interest of such studies uh, with this uh, study, again, by Julie Gono and collaborators, showing the, that the topological properties of graphs constructed from resting dead fMRI can predict chronologic age across the lifespan. So in this study, they, the authors use different cohorts, you can see here, which they split in train, validation, and test subsets, and then also uh, process the data and perform graph analysis, to compute a neural network uh, predictive model, which, um, which then they use to calculate a predicted age difference pad score, which reflect the difference between the predicted brain age and the chronological age. Higher pad score indicate accelerated brain age, while, while lower values of pad score indicate delayed brain age. And they studied uh, participants with uh, autosomal dominant AD. And what they showed is that mutation carriers showed a uh, higher PAT score, so accelerated brain age compared to mutation non carriers. Uh, and especially those uh, with amyloid deposition in their brain. So uh, this uh, shows the relevance of, uh, of such concept and the fact that we are able using resting state fMRI networks and graph analysis to um, get relevant information about uh, brain age. Uh, so in this study, Evers and collaborator have assessed uh, segregation of functional connections which reflect the balance between within network connectivity and between network connectivity. And this, they showed that higher segregation of functional connection into distinct large scale networks support cognitive resilience in Alzheimer's disease. 
So um, you can see here that uh, higher segregation, uh, which is represented here in uh, black, let's say, or uh, dark blue. Um, uh, no, sorry, uh, dark blue represents lower segregation, while orange, the orange color represents higher segregation of, uh, um, of functional connection into large-scale networks. And you can see that those participants in orange with higher segregation uh, show attenuated effect of estimated years to symptom onset on global cognition compared to those with the lower segregation. Uh, so this is in um, autosomal dominant AD. And in patients with sporadic AD, they show that uh, so those with higher segregation uh, show uh, less decrement in global cognition compared to those with uh, lower segregation. Um, so let's say a few words uh, about intervention. So as we've said, we were able to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by reduction of risk factors. And those risk factors vary according to the life, throughout the lifespan. Uh, several studies uh, have shown the impact on several uh, of those risk factors. And uh, uh, they have shown also that complementary uh, different factors might have complementary effects. For example, you can see here on the same population, the impact of physical activity on gray matter volume. And here in blue, the impact of cognitive activity on brain volume. And you can see that uh, the, uh, those two activities have, have an impact on distinct brain regions, suggesting distinct mechanism, and also the fact that they ha might have a complementary effect. And also, as I told you, we've, we've seen that physical activity might differ uh, according to sex. Uh, uh, this is another uh, study from a Peranian collaborator showing that bilingualism uh, have also a positive impact on a reserve, also procure reserve. Uh, in, and this is a study on probable Alzheimer's disease patients showing that at the same level of cognitive impairment, bilingual individuals show greater hypometabolism compared to um, those monolingual uh, individuals. Um, and uh, this uh, suggests that lifelong bilingualism contributes to great cognitive reserve through increasing FDG connectivity notably. You can see here that uh, there were both positive and negative correlation with brain metabolism and brain connectivity, suggesting both neural reserve and compensatory mechanisms in uh, distinct brain regions. Um, if we look at the factors that have been uh, used to in, in uh, preventive clinical trials um, uh, and that, that are thought to have a, a negative impact on, uh, on the brain and uh, to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, we can see that there is education, smoking, physical activity, uh, hypertension, diabetes and obesity. Uh, but also depression, and depression is also one of the most important risk factor in late life. It is, however, um, often omitted in uh, clinical preventive clinical trials um, uh, to date. Uh, so uh, we we aimed at at uh, assessing whether um, mental training through meditation that might help to reduce. Uh, depressive, but also stress, anxiety, and uh, other psychoaffective factors that are uh, occurring with age and that have a, uh, that increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease might have an impact on uh, aging and reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Our model and theory propose that um, mindfulness uh, and uh, loving kindness, compassion, meditation might have a positive effect on aging through improved attention and control, metacognitive monitoring, and prosocial capacities, which would in turn both uh, upregulate favorable, beneficial, positive factors for aging and downregulate adver adverse and detrimental factors uh, for aging. 
so to test this uh, hypothesis, we uh, have first conducted a pilot study in older expert meditators. So there were six older expert meditators. They are expert because they have more than 10,000 hours of meditation practice, which we have compared to a group of elderly uh, controls the same age. They are all cognitively normal. And what we showed is that the um, expert meditators show increased uh, brain volume and uh, glucose metabolism in specific brain regions, including the um, anterior cingulate and ventral medial prefrontal, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the right insula. Um, and this suggests better, better brain maintenance, higher uh, volume and glucose metabolism in those expert individuals in these regions that are very sensitive to age, as you can see here, um, compared to uh, non-meditators uh, individuals. So uh, we have conducted a large-scale European study uh, from the H2020 work program promoting mental health and well-being. The name of the project is Silver Santé Study or uh, Meditating for the uh, official name. And uh, in this study, we have conducted two large clinical tri trials, SCD well and H well. In SCD well, we wanted to assess the impact of meditation intervention over two months, eight weeks in patients with subjective cognitive decline, mostly on behavior as, uh, measures, outcomes. And in age well, uh, we aimed at assessing the impact of an 18 month meditation intervention compared to uh, language learning and uh, to a passive control on multiple outcomes, including behavioral, but also biological and neuroimaging uh, measures. The results of, on the primary outcome of the SCD well clinical trials showed uh, the primary outcome was uh, the STI as a reflect of anxiety, which is a relevant, clinically relevant uh, outcome in patients with subjective clinical uh, cognitive decline. And we showed that meditation was able to significantly reduce uh, this, the level of anxiety of those patients as do the uh, active healthy education program after the uh, intervention, but also this was maintained at six months. Um, as for the age well study, uh, so uh, this study has just been uh, finished. In this study, uh, as I said, we have uh, three, as I said, we have three arms, but also a group of expert meditators. And the results of the primary outcome analysis is, uh, is about to be published. It is uh, under embargo until uh, October 10th. Uh, so I invite you to uh, refer to the website, which uh, address is here to see the list of publications uh, that have already been uh, out from this project. And I would like to thank very uh, warmly all my team, group, and uh, students that have contributed and postdocs that have contributed to uh, the results I've presented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kyle, for this so comprehensive uh, presentation of uh, how the brain can cope with aging disease and even improve with specific intervention. I think everybody would appreciate your talk. And now, shall we move to the last one by Professor Valentina Garibotto? She is uh, in the division, is a division chair of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging at the University Hospital of Geneva. She is an associate professor and a group leader at the Geneva University. She is supported by several funds in, of important uh, support and foundation. And uh, she's also a Congress chair elected at the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and chair of the neuroimaging group of the Swiss Society of Nuclear Medicine. She published a lot of papers. We both collaborated since ages. And uh, I'm very happy to listen to you, Valentina. And uh, please, your talk will be uh, related to the artificial intelligence. So a method that can be applied to uh, the analysis of large data set. Please, Valentina. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Thank you for the very nice words. 
And uh, thank you for thank I thank the Prada Foundation, all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It has been fantastic to listen to these uh, first two talks by Rick and Gael, and I'm continue to I'm happy to continue discussing how artificial intelligence can support our investigation of the brain with molecular imaging. We've seen already great results obtained with natural human brains. So let's see what we can expect uh, from artificial brains to interfere, to, let's say, to be introduced in this field. Um, so uh, first, as a definition, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, it, it is in general, uh, as you see here, a, a global uh, term that groups all algorithms that mimic intelligence. In this uh, um, context, we can uh, see machine learning uh, in which algorithms can be trained and learned from data and deep learning, a subset that is based on the use of neural networks. Um, and this, I mean, we know it exists in many applications. Uh, we probably all think about the use of uh, auto-driving cars. Uh, and in medicine is uh, eagerly awaited as a support, as a help, as a tool to reduce errors uh, in uh, speech recognition, for example, in the interpretation of uh, uh, medical outputs, such as HE in electrocardiography, uh, or in the, uh, for example, motion of robots in surgery. So really in all the aspects. And of course, neurodegeneration and imaging is included. You've already seen many images and the images that Daniela, Rick and Gael have presented are all mainly based on the PET technique. PET systems are tomographs as every medical tomograph that are, rely for their building images on injecting radioactive tracers. And depending on the tracer, uh, behavior or affinity will have very different images. So the FDG, the images measuring glucose metabolism, uh, are obtained with a tracer that uh, is glucose rendered radioactive. And the images of amyloid or tau aggregates are based on using radio pharmaceuticals or radio tracers that target these specific pathologies in the brain. Um, in this field, what we expect from uh, artificial intelligence is mainly divided in two big uh, areas. We would like for artificial intelligence on one hand to deal with the tedious tasks. Uh, behind all the very nice work that uh, Gael and Rick have presented you, there is a lot of processing, for example, images that have to be realigned, segmented, processed. There is a lot of automation, but of course, uh, let's say an artificial uh, intelligent tool that can transform the individual image into a standard image that can be compared with other brains would uh, speed up the process. And then another, let's say, chapter would be to use artificial intelligence to improve our human performances. You've seen from the two previous talks that we are dealing with very large amount of data and data that are complex, multi-layer. So we're taking into account the um, char clinical characteristics of the person, uh, its background, its education, and let's say story throughout life. And at the same time, we're measuring glucose metabolism, amyloid, tau, perfusion, uh, gray matter density, so blood biomarkers. So a lot of uh, layers of information that we, that possibly an artificial brain could more efficiently than us combine to discover novel mechanisms. If we want to imagine the images that we've seen and we obtained in a life cycle, we can imagine in a clinical routine that the test is prescribed and then we select which tracer we should use to answer this question and then the image is acquired uh, in research these would step this step would be let's say deciding the clinical the, the clinical research question and then deciding which tracer is the most um, accurate tracer to answer to the question and then we would still acquire the images and then when we have the images, if it's in the clinical 
uh, routine, it will be uh, important to classify this image as normal or abnormal uh, and what kind of abnormality is there, then report it in a textual output. If it's a uh, research, uh, we will want to, let's say, learn out of these images that have been collected, uh, novel mechanisms, associations, strategies to treat and prevent. How artificial intelligence can intervene in this life cycle. Uh, on these, let's say, pre-acquisition uh, steps and on the acquisitions per se, there are a number of tools that are in elaboration. For example, uh, to select either alerts on um, contraindication to a test or uh, efficiently select the clinical history. And this would be very re relevant for research as well. I mean, automatically identifying from medical records, patients or individuals that are potentially eligible for a study um, without the risk of error or identify, for example, characteristics of the individual that are at high risk for no-show. Uh, we are talking about procedures that are complex with a tracer that is synthesized specifically for the test and for the patient that is imaged. So of course, having a no-show uh, or having to cancel the procedure is uh, a really unwanted situation. For the radio tracer selection and production, there are a number of aspects that could be augmented by artificial intelligence, namely the match between the tracer and the target. I'm not a radio chemist expert. I want to further dig into this. And for the acquisition of the images and their reconstruction, there is one specific aspect I want to emphasize because I think it's very interesting and very promising, and is the ability of artificial intelligence to augment our the images we obtain, uh, starting from low dose images to obtain simulated full dose images. What I mean by this, I've shown you the, the, the system. If you want to learn better how the uh, PET system works, it's physics beyond, I'm sure you'll find many relevant information on the ongoing exhibition at the Fondazione Prada. Um, but in principle, it's like a, it's like a camera. So it collects radioactive uh, events that happen in the patient because we injected the tracer. And of course, the number of events determines the quality of the image we get. So if we have a very little event, a low dose image, we end up of an image of the brain like this one. So very noisy, you see, you see only spots and you have an image that is impossible to interpret. So in order to correct for this, we increase the time of acquisition. So we let the patient on the scanner enough time to have enough event, and then we increase the dose that we inject. But artificial intelligence is very good in, in learning on many, on large series of these type of images and their equivalent in full dose for the same individuals. And then in finding strategies to pass from one from a low dose image to a full dose, virtual full dose image. And this is a work that has been done by uh, our group uh, in collaboration with a group of, of the uh, medical physics here. And you see that uh, with two different strategies, I won't go into the details, but we obtain very nice images uh, starting from this low dose information. So starting from a 20th of the dose. And of course, dose means radiation to the patient. So if we can reduce it, as in this simulated case of 120th, uh, we open the perspective of having, I mean, healthy individuals that come regularly and repeatedly to our, uh, for having a PET scan, uh, it opens the possibility of really repeating the test under multiple radio traces. So it's really an exciting development. Uh, if then the major task will be either to classify the output we have or, as I said, to discover novel mechanisms. You've seen already presented, so I'll skip this part, uh, or by Rick, that when we look at FDG bed images, we try to recognize patterns. So this is usually a thing that artificial intelligence can do well. This is a paper reporting the performance of a neural network system uh, compared with 
human readers that are the dots represented here uh, to classify Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia from two large uh, um, available shared cohorts. And you see that the area under the curve, so the, the diagnostic performance of the tool was very high uh, with a classification uh, with an accuracy of over 90%. And what is very relevant is that, and a concept that is increasingly um, evaluated in artificial intelligence is that we do not want, um, want to have, let's say, a black box system in which we obtain a classification, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, without knowing how the algorithm developed this response. So with an exclusion experiment, we can see where uh, the which are the areas of the brain that is the network used to classify in one sense or in the other. And you see in this work that if we consider what are the patterns of Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia, the areas that were considered relevant by the system to classify these two populations as compared with healthy controls are indeed the areas that are known to be pathological in these conditions. But of course, artificial intelligence cannot do everything and uh, uh, can improve or automate some process. But there are intrinsically difficult um, processes or um, situations in which the information is simply not there. Uh, we've heard that FDG PET is a very good tool also to predict uh, the, let's say, the decline over time. Uh, Rick has shown the excellent performance that Tau PET has in this field. For FDG, these data refer to FDG, the performance remains in the range of 80% more or less accuracy. And you see that over time, these are the graphs refer to different decades. Or with larger uh, data included in the data sets, the performance remains more or less the same and less good than when distinguishing demented and healthy controls. So also for artificial intelligence, there are simple and less simple tasks. For amyloid PET, there are, again, reports of the uh, ability of these systems to accurately classify positive and negative scans. I show you here some exam individual examples for the different traces that exist. In this field, first, there are studies that try to correct the differences between tracers using artificial intelligence. Again, training on individuals that have done both traces and then obtaining synthetic images uh, all uh, on a similar tracer that could increase comparability across cohorts. And again, when we talk about classification, this is a fairly simple task also for a visual reader. And indeed, this corresponds to a very good performance of an disautomated system. And then I do hope that the systems will also be able to help us in our daily clinical work of writing reports. Um, we expect help either in the automated production of reports or in the interpretation of the reports we have in retrospective series. You know that hospitals are digital now, so all data are there in a digital form, but most of these data are very difficult to use for research purposes because these are unclassified data. So it's simple text for a lot of, uh, uh, for a very large part of the content. And in tools that could extract from this text meaningful information and classify it would be very useful. I'm hopeful you see here as a, as a, a reference the um, a, a fo an, an image that has been generated by this DAL E one and two systems uh, that generate images starting from a simple description, a painting of a fox sitting in a field at sunrise in the style of Claude Monet. And this is the result. So I'm convinced that in the same sense, we will be able to have help for our clinical methods. And then there is also, of course, the chapter of disease modeling studies. Um, Rick and Gail have shown you already the very large panel of uh, relevant information that exists in the literature and that have been extracted using um, clinical cohorts, et cetera. Uh, 
Uh, one of the strategies that have been tested by this uh, group uh, is the group of Marco Lorenzi we collaborate with in Sofia Antipolis in France, um, is to use the data that have been collected, for example, in ADNI, and combine the uh, different observations of amyloid, uh, FDG, and MRI collected across thousands of individuals in a, a simulated Alzheimer's disease uh, progression, which they call SimulAD, in order to, on the combination of the three elements, the presence of atrophy, of, FDG, of uh, hypometabolism and amyloid accumulation, have a measure of the time to AD. So uh, selecting all this information and building a model, they will and they end up in uh, different uh, phases of accumulation or different forms of accumulation on these three different dimensions that can be plotted in a time scale. Uh, and of course, this is then a very relevant, uh, let's say, um, single or summary indicator that can be used to classify one individual because using multiple uh, data that have been collected, multiple imaging modalities can be expanded to fluid biomarkers that are arriving. Um, we can have a very relevant information for a single individual, which is the time to conversion to dementia. And uh, one important, one very important thing in, um, thing in um, uh, artificial intelligence research is the use of external validations. So in this case, the data have been trained on ADNI, then tested on an independent, on a, a part that was not used for training in ADNI, but also in our Geneva memory cohort. And you see that when we test what is the time to dementia that we observe in different populations that have been defined clinically and on the basis of their follow-up, we obtain results that are very logical. So the patients that have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease dementia are indeed in the post the time to dementia phase. MCI that then at follow-up converted, but this is their baseline uh, imaging, are in the close range to conversion. MCI that are still stable are the most variable group. And here, of course, uh, reserve and compensatory mechanism clearly play a role. And then those uh, individuals that were stable and were healthy, cognitively healthy at baseline and um, that remain stable at follow up are very far from their AD dementia onset. Uh, and another very powerful uh, in information that we could get from modeling is uh, the ability to uh, see what is the effect of an intervention. And here, what is simulated is an amyloid lowering intervention, but one could simulate also uh, cognitive enhancement, meditation intervention, uh, assuming that we can know the biological effect on one of the process. And of course, assuming this is another necessary assumption that the interplay between the different processes is not modulated by the intervention, we could simulate what happens on atrophy, glucus metabolism, and amyloid when we apply, for example, an amyloid lowering intervention that reduces amyloid by 100%, so removes it at times minus 20 from the beginning, or when the intervention is only 50% effect at the same time. Um, so I hope I could show you the different potential and current application that have been tested in research. Then what about the daily clinical activity, the daily use of these tools, as uh, Rick has uh, very clearly pointed out, both amyloid and now tau, are NFTG, of course, are routinely used clinical tools. Um, to have an idea, I uh, there are I referred to this database of FDA cleared uh, artificial intelligence software uh, cited here. Um, the situation in Europe is not identical, but it follows the same trend. You see that after quite a long time, these last five years we really see tools coming to reality. 
and 2022, this is the um, um, an analysis that I did at the beginning of this week, uh, is probably going to be as high as 2021 or even higher. Uh, but specifically for the field we're interested in, so molecular imaging for uh, neurodegeneration, we have currently six tools. The majority of these tools focus on the image denoising or enhancement that I showed you before, so the ability of obtaining uh, high quality images from lower quality images. And then on the scar uh, segmentation of specific organs, but not specifically for the brain. So we still have to have some patience. So in conclusion, I would say that artificial intelligence is really becoming a reality in many medical fields, including the diagnosis and investigation of neurodegenerative disorders with molecular imaging. Uh, research studies show really exciting, promising performances. And we also have studies on disease modeling that could have the potential to help understanding disease mechanism and also the treatment effect. Uh, a key point here is validation in independent and large shared data sets, because this will be the, the, the step that will be needed for their larger use, both in the clinical and research community. And of course, for the clinical implementation, we will really depend on the approval of these clinical tools and their integration into an effective clinical workflow. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for your questions, as well as the other speakers of today's panel. Thank you, Valentina, also to you, to this very, very special talk on uh, this uh, modeling uh, new tools uh, to interpret uh, images and large data set and to apply this, uh, this tool, perhaps in the future, also in clinical settings and most of all in the research area. So now we have time, at least 20 minutes for question and answers. And uh, as I told at the beginning, uh, the participants should write their questions on the proper area. And uh, we all will try to, to answer. Since and if the participants a, a, feel, I'll oh, go again. <laughs> because we have many questions, one for the other. <laughs> Please go again. Thank you. I would have a question for you, Rick, because it was very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I was wondering, because you, you, you discussed a lot about cognitively unimpaired, about NCI, amyloid tau, etc. I would be very interesting to know what you think about this with subjective cognitive impairment and the role of tau, the, the complementary role of tau and amyloid uh, pathogen in those participants. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, it's a it's a great question. Um, actually, in 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 the study I presented, where we looked at the the role of amyloid and tau path status on on clinical progression over time, uh, that group actually also included some some individuals with subjective uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive decline. So it, it was a study comprised of seven different cohorts. For example, our our cohort in Amsterdam, as you know, is 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 a cohort consisting of individuals with subjective cognitive decline, and also in the Swedish Biofinder study, some are cognitively unimpaired and, and some have SED. So out of those thirteen hundred, I guess that roughly two hundred of them actually had had SED. Uh, so in a subset, we we looked whether their slopes looked any different from the, the ones that, for example, participated participated in population studies. And, and we did not find a difference there. Uh, but again, the, the sample size was, was smaller. Uh, so this, this needs to be re replicated. But there's no suggestion at this point that it may be very different bet between them. Uh, and also, I guess that, that would be in line with our earlier um, uh, meta-analysis on the prevalence of, of amyloid pathology that actually showed pretty similar um, uh, prevalence of, of, of amyloid positivity between, uh, again, participants in population studies and uh, people that came to the clinic with with um, with memory complaints, but without objective impairment. So, do you think, if I can add something, that uh, tau PET studies can really add something in the risk of progression of subjects with uh, sub subjective cognitive complaint, or even more in subjects with MCI, mild cognitive impairment? This is your opinion. 
Greek. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. But we should probably also talk about how we how we define amyloid and tau, right? Because in 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 the ATN system, it 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 it's it's sort of mutually exclusive, right? So whether it comes from mm -hmm. from a pet or from from CSF, it it, it has the yeah. same weight. I think for amyloid, mm -hmm. that's maybe could be reasonable. I, I guess the, the 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 concordance is also rel relatively high. Mm -hmm. But for tau, I really think it's it's a different story. It, it it's a big difference if you're tau pet positive or whether you are CSF p tau positive or plasma p tau positive. That changes much earlier in in the disease stage, and is therefore yeah. also further away from 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 cognitive decline. So I think if you have SED and you you are tau pet positive, then the 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 risk of of progression over time increases a lot. Yes, I, I agree, but I think also it's very, very important the topography of the yes. tau deposition. Because uh, as I show in my slide, and we have preliminary evidence, if it's still uh, limited to the temporal medial cortex, you really cannot say there is a risk of progression in subjective. And uh, in addition, there are new uh, evidence, uh, recent new evidence, on populations that are amnestic MCI, who really doesn't belong to the Alzheimer's disease category. We have heard about that. These are very stable person, but clinically you cannot differentiate. So it's very important to use PET tools, either FTG, because it shows that there is no the pattern of AD, or even tau, which is absent because they are a different pathology or restricted the temporal medial cortex. So the topography I think is very, very important for that. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe I, I can I can ask a question to 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 Gael. So actually, so in 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 our study, you, you saw that people that were amyloid and tau pet positive um, had a high risk of decline, but there were still quite a lot of individuals that that were stable over time. I think that's quite remarkable, right? If you have advanced pathology, uh, but you you preserve your your um, cognition so well, um, so. What do you think are, are, are potential underlying mechanisms? In, in, in other words, how would you try to, to characterize those people that, that, that are you know, stable over time despite abundant pathology in, in the brain? Yes, yeah. is the answer. <laughs> of course, yeah. But, yeah, but, of course. but how to study, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they have both amyloid and tau, so I think that, yes, it's mainly about brain reserve functional mechanisms, networks, and all what what we, we discussed a bit uh, today. Um, I think the question is a bit different if they have only, of course, amyloid or an only tau and they would like show brain maintenance longer time than those that would like either develop copathologies or, or uh, ABT and tau if they had only the, the other one um, and convert uh, faster to um, MCI or AD. So uh, the reason in the, the question in those participants who only had one lesion, for example, and would stay longer cognitively normal than those that show faster decline is also important, I think. Why would some of them develop like tau faster than others while they have amyloid in their brain? Mm -hmm. and, and, and for this one, I, I'm not sure it's only reserve. Of course, we, we cannot... Uh, uh, reserve uh, definitely should uh, operate the same as for those who have both amyloid and tau, but uh, there might be also something else that would trigger uh, the um, the presence of, of of the other lesion, for example, uh, tau if amyloid was present. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would have a question related to this topic, Gail. Um, with your meditation study, on which on which mechanism do you hope to intervene most, uh, prevention or compensation mechanism? So I think it's mainly on prevention mechanisms and uh, uh, especially including, for example, uh, brain uh, maintenance, brain um, yeah, brain maintenance. Uh, for example, in, in the study I showed you on. Um, uh, uh, expert meditators, they show higher brain volume and higher and greater brain metabolisms. Uh, and also uh, in the study I, I showed you, we are in really early stages uh, in patients with subjective cognitive decline first, uh, but mainly here, our goal was more on, on symptoms, anxiety symptoms, uh, but also uh, on age well, and the study on meditation was really first uh, devoted to 
cognitively unimpaired elderly, and second, designed to be over 18 months, which was unique in the literature, so that so that it could operate at long term on uh, on this brain uh, maintenance and uh, uh, reserve capacity. Fantastic, thank you. And then, if I can, also a quick question to Rick. Um, indeed, the topography is very relevant, and it's very nice on your work uh, to see that also the medial temporal uh, deposition ultimately on tau has an impact on follow up and on decline. If I understood correctly, so also medial temporal those that are positive in medial temporal lobe are um, declining more or less with a similar uh, slope than those with neocortical deposits. Yeah. Um... That is true. If uh, progression to, to mild cognitive impairment is, is the outcome measure, then, then, then those survival curves are, are almost identical. But if you look at um, progression to, to dementia, uh, it's, it, it's different. So then actually only the ones with neocortical tau pet signal yes. progress to, to dementia. Okay. And, I, I, and I, I didn't show it, but we also looked at cognition in a more continuous manner. So we, we used the MMC, MMC measure of global cognition. And we used uh, the PEC, so this, this very uh, sensitive preclinical um, uh, cognitive tool. And there you also see some differentiation be between the groups. And it seems to be the case that this medial temporal lobe does worse on, on the memory part of the comp composite, mm -hmm. whereas the neocortical one additionally has uh, executive uh, the dysfunction. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so it's a more sort of widespread um, uh, cognitive decline in that sense. Yeah. I think this is very, very important. This is a marker, for sure, a marker of cognitive progression, a large deposition of tau. But I have also a question to all of you, because you are involved in tau, FTG, and amyloid studies. It, it is my experience, and your Valentina too. There are patients, subjects, with very, very few hypometabolism, and then you test them with tau. There is a large amount of tau in cortical. Or the opposite. So this is a very important point we have to investigate because we still don't know the role of tau on the generation as measured by synaptic dysfunction. We know more on amyloid, which is a large plaques are not really such so too much interfering with the function of the brain. The oligomers is different, but PET cannot measure oligomers. So tau is in the neurons. Tau can be very much diffuse and metabolism is still spared. Or the opposite, we see typical patterns related to dementia and very, I'm, we are in the field of Alzheimer's, and very few uh, tau in the brain. How can we explain that as a future for, for research? Do you have an idea? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it, uh, uh, those, those cases exist, but uh, I guess in general, it, it's fair to say that I think tau pet correlates very strongly, right, with, with atrophy and, and hypometabolism. But the, the, there are on, on sort of both sides of the, of, of the extremes, the, the, there are, are these exceptions and the, they're extremely interesting to, 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 to study as well. So in case where there's little tau pathology, but a, a lot more hypometabolism, I think that one is easier to explain because I think they probably have have other um, pathologies that, that may uh, reduce the, the, the levels of glucose metabolism. So that could be also nuclein or TDP43 or, or vascular, uh, vascular or pathologies, vascular, microvascular, et cetera. I, I agree. Uh, the, the, the other part is, is, for me, is more difficult to, to explain. So those are people that have uh, a lot of tau, but relatively yeah. uh, preserve glucose metabolism. So the only thing is um, yeah, they, they apparently have higher brain resilience. So they, they keep the structure better preserved than, than, than other people relative to, to, to the level of tau. Uh, we, we have found some evidence that, you know, the, 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 they are related to, to, to aging. So in general, um, at, a, at, a, at a similar level of tau, older people show more atrophy, more, more hypometabolism. And we also know with aging that repairment mechanisms go down. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's one, one part of the explanation. Um, but those individuals are highly interesting to study. Uh, interesting. Yeah. For research. For, yeah. yeah. And I would still have a quick comment on the, or a question on the mesial temporal part, because of course you've also shown that the photopsipier tracer, for example, which is the one you also used for that study, is validated for its use for BRAC stages four and beyond. But actually, when you measure medial temporal atrophy, medial temporal signal, sorry, you're measuring stages one, three. So you're still convinced that that's specific signal, right? Yeah, but I, I do think, so if you see the PET signal in the medial temporal lobe, 
for me, that means that probably at, at, at post-mortem investigation, you would actually find uh, uh, tau pathology also in, in, in neocortical areas. But just probably the, 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 the density of tau is, is too low at that point of time for, for the tau petrizer to, to pick it up. I do think it's already spread out, at least the seeds and probably also the, the aggregations. Uh, but again, the, 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 the density of tau needs to be relatively high in order to, uh, to pick it up by, by this generation of, of uh, tau petrizers. So in principle, when we see a negative scan, it could be a BRAC 123. And when we see a scan that is looks like in BRAC 123 positivity, it's probably already four and above. That that is Finally. Sure. It's certainly possible, but but uh, but also it 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 makes sense if you if you if you look at the data, right? So even in 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 the tau pet negative range, for example, there is there is a correlation between the the, the tau pet levels and again atrophy and and, and cognition. Um, so I guess you are you are in the accumulation process of of uh, of tau, but I guess that the tau pet is just a little bit behind in terms of the actual uh, neuropathology. Yeah, sure. May, may, oh, so, uh, may I ask a question to 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 Valentina? Please. Yeah, because I was uh, actually I, I've, I have two questions. It's it's hard to pick one. Maybe, maybe start with with the more uh, controversial one because you're. Uh, in, uh, apart from a great scientist, you're also a nuclear medicine physician, right? And you, yeah. you, you could potentially consider artificial intelligence maybe a threat to your uh, existence as a, as a nuclear medicine physician. So how, how do you how do you view that um, that that in the future? I have uh, I had the last slide that I removed. That was a slide oh. from quotes, and the quotes I'll summarize to you. There is a there was a famous. Artificial intelligence expert intervening in a radiology congress like four or five years ago saying we should stop training radiologists. It's clear that their job will be disappearing in four or five years. And then other quotes that, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, prediction didn't uh, um, confirm yet, but I mean, who knows in the future? Yeah. And then um, other quotes that mentioned that uh, uh, artificial intelligence won't replace radiologists, but radiologists able to use artificial intelligence will replace radiologists not able to use artificial intelligence. And this is my take. I think that we have uh, the possibility, not quite yet, but I'm impatient in seeing them in my daily practice. We have the possibility of having tools that really help for the tedious tasks and uh, have more reliable responses and possibly discover new mechanisms and new associations. But uh, I mean, the human hand ultimately remains necessary in many tasks and the, the, the work apart from the pure or crude reporting will become more elaborated, more into dialogue with clinicians and researchers on the different fields on how these techniques can be useful in answering different questions. So overall, more interesting. So I would say, I mean, not necessarily train more nuclear medicine specialists, but at least enroll into a training program if you're interested mm -hmm. into this to the young audience. If there is. Thank you, Valentina. Do you have another question, Rick? You said you have two. Yeah, yeah, I, I had another one. Some I, minutes I too. There are yeah, no questions. Sure. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it was just a thought I had. So I was wondering, so artificial intelligence, I think can also maybe be used to maybe create um, uh, synthetic images um, uh, that, that has been done before, right? So uh, so we, we know PET is a, is a relatively expensive and, 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 and labor intensive technique. So maybe there are ways to use artificial intelligence to yeah to create um, sort of artificial PET images with, without making a PET scan, for example, mm -hmm. based on, CT or MRI, and maybe add some some blood-based biomarker information and some demographic information. Do, do you think that's a, that's a realistic scenario? I mean, when the relationship, I, I had this discussion recently with the group, of course, that is working on artificial intelligence here. Uh, specifically, the question here was to try to simulate early scans from late scans and vice versa. We're used when we scan for amyloid PET, and I think that possibly your centers as well to scan uh, dual time. So we scan right after injection to have a perfusion map and then uh, of a various duration from 10 minutes if it's only clinical to 20, 30 minutes if we want to use it also for um, dynamic modeling and then uh, scan at the regular time for amyloid or tau positions. 
And uh, the, the question of these, uh, um, uh, let's say, researchers was to be able to, I mean, simulate one from the other. And what, let's say, leaves me skeptical is the, um, the fact that this would be really generated information. Because uh, we know that there is no, uh, uni let's say, univocal relationship between perfusion and amyloid between accumulation and vice versa. This is what we're discussing. We might have a lot of amyloid and still no hyperperfusion. We might have a positive uh, P tau in the plasma or in the CSF and no yet visible deposition. So in this sense, to generate the image, I'm afraid it would work in the majority of the extreme simple cases. So the negative would stay negative, would simulate negative uh, brain images and the fully positive would possibly stimulate correct average fully positive images. We would really all lose all that added information that one technique has over the other and vice versa. So I'm not particularly convinced that this will succeed, but again, we'll, we'll see. Very interesting topic, and we will see in the future. Absolutely. So I'm very sad to see that there are no questions by the audience. I don't know why. Uh, too young, too shame, I don't know. We can wait one minute more, but uh, the time is running. And so I think if there is silence and no other questions, I think we can also close our workshop which will be uh, on uh, YouTube in any case, so many people can uh, listen to our talks and enjoy and uh, think about. And uh, for now, thank you very much for the participation, for the talks, and I hope to see you around <laughs> for other reasons. And uh, so bye-bye to everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye, bye. bye, bye Valentina. Bye. Bye, Gail.